Let's go back to 1987 when you first arrived in South Africa and were posted here as ambassador. The country was in a very different situation than we have now, internationally wasn't well received. How did you feel coming on to this country as ambassador? Well, when I, when I arrived, one of the first people I met was the head of the security police, General Johan van der Merwe. And, uh, you know, he, you, you declared a state of emergency. Uh, and 2,500 people were in de detention without trial. And, you know, the NC leaders were in jail or in Lusaka and so on. But the country wasn't sort of in a, in a very revolutionary state by any means at that point. And I said to him, how is it? that the country this time uh, at present is relatively quiet and he said to me because this time we've locked up all the right people he said <laughs> the only proviso i might add i saw that you mentioned that but that was also during one of the longest running strikes that we've had in the mining indeed and uh, uh, the next person i met was cyril ramaphosa who uh, you know was head of the mining mining union cyril was an extremely effective negotiator as you know and uh, i said to him you know well done with your you know the, the the progress you've been making with this, but be careful not to, you know, do the same as Arthur Scargill did in Britain, which was to destroy his own union. And Cyril, you know, pushed it to the absolute limit and then settled for very much better terms for the Mine Workers Union. And the Mine Workers Union was a major force in the land. It really was under apartheid, let alone later. Part of the task, I guess, from the British representing British interest was to try and also secure the release of political prisoners and also get towards some kind of negotiated revolution, which was always going to be very different from that which had happened in Zimbabwe. How did you find that as a difference to what had been the situation in Zimbabwe? Well, in Zimbabwe, you know, we did the negotiating. We, we, we wrote the constitution, We've, you know, we pushed it through and so on. Uh, it was perfectly obvious that in South Africa, you know, that, that couldn't, wouldn't, that shouldn't be our role at all. I mean, that had that settlement had to take place between black and white South Africans. Uh, but what we could try to do was facilitate it. So, you know, we did everything we could to promote, uh, you know, getting to the point at which those negotiations could take place direct between all you guys, not, not us. And we tried to do that in, in a variety of ways. I mean, Thatcher had completely given up on P.W. Borta. She didn't like him. She knew he'd been a German sympathizer during the war. She knew that he was running a regime which believed in, quotes, taking out its enemies and so on. Uh, initially, she'd had more hopes of him. He said, you know, you remember he said, we adapt or die. He did abolish the past laws. He did abolish the Mixed Marriages Act. <coughs> but after that, nothing. And she bombarded him with messages which said, you know, release Mandela, start negotiations and so on, and got nowhere. You were privileged, I guess, to interact with a lot of different characters and often on opposing side. I mean, you speak of being the bridge between Nelson Mandela, F.W. de Klerk, and Chief Mangosutu Busilezi. How was that as an experience for you, being able to navigate between the well, three? Well, it was, it <coughs> was um, first of all, let's, let's, you know, let's start with Butelezi. And I had many meetings with Butelezi in Olundi, and it sometimes is forgotten about Butelezi what an important part he played, because the important part he played was to absolutely refuse independence for his homeland and also absolutely to refuse to negotiate with the government so long as Mandela remained in jail. So he constantly laid down that condition. Uh, otherwise, the government would have, in the end, tried to have some kind of co-option agreement with uh, but lazy. Now, but lazy would not have been, you know, but lazy is not easy to co-opt, believe me. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, he deserves great credit for the stand he took then, as I used to say to Mandela. And Mandela, by the way, agreed. Uh, with de Klerk, I had a very interesting first meeting with de Klerk. You know, he was reputedly the very conservative leader of the Transvaal Party. But when I was leaving the meeting, he said to me, you were in Rhodesia, weren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I just want you to know that if I have my way, we won't make the same mistakes they did. So I said, well, that's good to know, but what do you think the mistake was? And he said, leaving it far too late to negotiate with the real black leaders. De Klerk is, was and is a civilian. I mean, he didn't like and wasn't part of the, the military security system, which was run by P.W. Bota and Milan and which, you know, created the so-called civil cooperation 
bureau, the flat plus unit and so on. So he thought that the, the whole system was far too militaristic.